and kind of lay them out. Um, That's really nice. That'll be that'll be a really nice uh, point where we start talking about that. Perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it is and, um, We are about to get rolling, Mr. Yudzin. Great. Right. So let's take our places. I'm admitting all of the fantastic folks that are joining us tonight. So good to see everyone Just piling in from the weight room. Hi, everyone. This is Carolina Wheat, uh, curator at Art Fair. I'm really happy to be here tonight for our series of live studio visits of Art Fair artists. Tonight's special guest is Alex Yudzin. And hi, uh, hi. while we're waiting for folks to pile in, uh, we're just going to take a moment to take some deep breaths and kind of manage the Zoom meeting. If you're having um, any friends meet us, they don't have Zoom, they can certainly watch us on the Art Fair Instagram live. We'll be Woo! up and running. <laughs> yes. Hey. hey. Uh, and then, of course, friends. <laughs> after it's all complete, we'll also have a recording on our YouTube channel of uh, every studio visit that we'll be conducting during the quarantine and this global health crisis. We're still letting folks in. It's looking pretty good. We've got 1802. And yeah. Thank you for joining us, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who has taken time out of their day to uh, tune in. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see so many, well, not see, but to have so many wonderful people. Yeah, and, and so for those that are new to Zoom or your first experience doing a studio visit with Art Fair, we're uh, asking everyone to mute their camera and mute their microphone. Or you don't have to mute your camera if you don't want to, but if you mute your microphone, please do. And uh, towards uh, 15 minutes towards the end, we'll allow a question and answer period so you can uh, ask Alex and the artist some questions. Alex is the artist, of course. And behind you, I see some fantastic black and white shots. I know are fairly new, but let me first introduce you as uh, Alex Woodson. Here he is. The uh, fantastic thing about Alex is that he kind of began as a painter and his photography career grew and grew as he was beginning to understand the normalcy of everyday life and these tropes of sunsets, flowers, waterfalls, and kind of deconstructed the everyday into the uncanny. And uh, he's had residencies at Headlands. He recently received a very honorable grant from NIFA and took that delicious cash to travel the 50 states um, in his project to document hotels and within them their furniture and, and creating these sculptural configurations that again kind of create this uncanny. So I suppose we'll start there, Alex. Uh, that which you have behind you is, is uh, quite a feat of balance and other things and I was hoping mm. you would be able to talk to us a little bit about your process. Well, thank you for that um, very kind uh, introduction, Carolina. I'm so happy to be here with, with you and with Art Fair. Uh, thank you for hosting this and for, for uh, giving this platform to all of us during this, this weird time. Um, so the work that you guys see behind me is an offshoot of, from an ongoing series called A Room for the Night, which I started uh, about five and a half years ago. And uh, it really was um, a project that, that started serendipitously. I, I found myself stuck in Basel, Switzerland with a lot of free time on my hand in a, a hotel room um, and decided to make these uh, sculptures using the furniture that I found there and photograph them. And up until then, I, I hadn't really considered myself uh, a photographer per se. I was working mostly in painting and drawing and mixed media. 
Uh, but the resulting photographs, which were black and white, were so intriguing that I started to really consider that, that um, there was a potential there for an ongoing series. And over the past five years, it's really uh, become a very central part of my practice as an artist. Um, so what I do is essentially I travel um, to different hotel rooms throughout the world. And uh, in the rooms that I stay in, I, I make uh, site-specific temporary sculptural installations using only the furniture and other objects uh, that I find in each room. And after the furniture uh, sculptures are photographed, and they're usually photographed in this kind of straight ahead style that's almost reminiscent of crime scene photography, the rooms are then um, put back in their original condition. And so all evidence of my kind of trespass is eliminated and the, the photograph remains as uh, uh, the, only, um, the only evidence of me having done this. Um, and a few years back, I, I had an idea to do a portrait of America uh, through this series going from state to state and recreating these sculptures in all the various hotel rooms in all 50 states. And as you mentioned this um, past year, I was very honored to receive a NIFA grant, uh, which didn't quite get me to all 50 states, but I was able to do 22 <laughs> within the span of about a month and a half of being on the road and clocking in like 7,000 miles on my car. Um, so I stayed in uh, 22 different states. I think it was a little over 20, 22 hotels, maybe like 24 different hotels. And the images that you guys see, and I'll, I'll take this so I can get a little closer to them. The images that you guys see up on the wall are the result of this uh, six week journey through the United States. Uh, I did the entire, or almost the entire Eastern seaboard, every, all, all the states east of the Mississippi. Um, and the only ones that I didn't get a chance to do were actually, ironically, the really close ones, which are um, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, and these are the test prints. So these aren't printed um, at the actual scale that the final images will be. Uh, these are just uh, processed and then printed uh, for my review here in, in, uh, in the studio. Alex, what uh, kind of camera do you use and what uh, type of paper and ink are you using or, or printer type are you using to print these? I know these are just tests, but what is your preference for from tests to actual, um, the original work? Well, you know, originally I was actually shooting these um, with a four by five. And one of the, um, one of the rules that I use when, when doing this work is that obviously I, I can't bring anything external uh, to the hotel. Uh, so I don't bring like um, props or I don't travel with furniture. It's only whatever I, I find and I work alone. So I don't have anybody um, traveling with me to help me balance some of these things. It's all, uh, if I can't do it myself, then I don't do it. Um, and another one of the rules is that I don't use uh, professional lighting. So it's whatever light that I find uh, in the room and then I have a, like a flash that I carry with me, uh, just like a regular camera flash. Because I kind of, I, I like the idea that these are, you know, sort of almost um, guerrilla style, you know, events, you know, that I go in there and, and um, I, I make the work in the way that anybody would make the work as opposed to, you know, going in like a professional photographer with tons of equipment and um, soft boxes and setting it up to be this perfect environment. Um, but one of the things that started to happen is um, as I became more and more experienced with using the flash, um, I started creating uh, different modifiers for the flash using like paper bags and whatever it was that I had on hand to actually shape and sculpt the light. And because that was such an experimental process and because sometimes it takes me a number of different 
uh, attempts before I get the flash and whatever modifier I'm putting in front of it uh, to work in the way that I want compositionally, um, I can't use a four by five anymore because I can't preview the result. So I'm using a digital camera, um, which is just a full frame digital camera. And then I'm processing them on my computer and printing them um, on uh, with, with um, an inkjet uh, printer. So the final result is uh, archival pigment prints printed on, you know, nice photographic rag paper. And that's a matte paper? Uh, these are like a luster paper. Luster. Yeah. And I'm, but you know, the, the other thing is I'm, I'm considering getting, uh, gelatin silver prints made out of these, which would be uh, a different kind of process, which they can make from digital files now. And it's a different look and a different, uh, a different feel to both the paper and the ink quality, because it's essentially a traditional printing method that they would be, um, creating uh, uh, digital negatives out of and then printing it in the dark room. So I don't have any of those yet because I haven't tried it, but that's, that's something that I'm, I'm considering doing. I could see how the digital silver, or the, the silver gelatin from a digital, uh, gosh, file and turned into a, <laughs> analog negative that it sounds so complicated it also is so complicated how this furniture is being <laughs> positioned and balanced and you know the, the, yeah so often the the figure appears and i i just have this curiosity if you know this um furniture ever was unwieldy or if you've ever been hurt or if anything had ever like been just a cataclysmic uh fail uh in relationship to some of these these compositions well, you know, it's it's something I've definitely gotten better at <laughs> as time has gone on. Um, but uh, I have been known to accidentally have furniture collapse, and um, usually it's not it's not too bad, and and nobody gets hurt. When I say nobody, I just mean myself. Um, and usually the furniture survives, but there have been a few times when. Um, I've created some damage that I've had to like creatively restore or hide. Um, actually like this, this room, this was the first room that I stayed in, which was uh, a room in Connecticut and it was next to a casino. And so it was like made to be this like really cheesy over the top Las Vegas style room. And they had these like ridiculous, like amphora vase lamps. And I kind of prop them on the edge of the table and they're being held in place with extension cords uh, that are plugged in. And one of them of course fell and self-destructed. Um, and I was freaking out because, <laughs> because when you get to the room, the first thing they give you is a price sheet of what everything costs. And like the, they have a flat screen dinky TV that's probably like 15 years old, but the price on it is $1,600. And so I figured they would charge me an arm and a leg if they ever found this broken lamp so the next morning i rushed out and i bought some super glue and i spent like two hours gluing it back together and i had some watercolor with me luckily so i painted in all of the like white cracks because when it broke apart it was all the plaster that that was that the lamp is made out of that was visible <laughs> um so that was a near catastrophe that um uh wasn't a catastrophe for me, it was more of like a budgetary catastrophe. This was like the first room that I was staying in and I had the knife of money. And I was worried that, you know, like $500 of that knife of money would be spent having to pay back this ridiculous wannabe hotel for a really cheesy lamp. Um, another time that something similar happened was when I was staying in this room, which was in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was a hotel that was kind of made to look like, like each room was sort of made to look like a chic New York style contemporary loft. And it was brand new. And you can kind of tell that it was sort of designed in a way where they could just sell the hotel rooms as, um, as mini apartments to people if, if, if that's the direction you wanted to go in, or they could just keep them as hotel rooms. 
So I had this like really large hotel room and everything was brand new and the furniture was super heavy as it often is in hotels because they, they uh, want it to last. So it's, it's like really built out of solid materials. And I, I um, made this sculpture and the whole thing was kind of tippy, but I thought it was okay. And I was just backing away from it after having taken this exact shot, I was backing away from it. And I just noticed a tip as I turned around from the corner of my eye and I turned back and the whole thing just essentially collapsed on me. Oh and there was, yeah, and it made it like the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. I mean, you would have thought that there was an explosion. And um, a couple of those pieces of furniture got damaged and there was a big dent in the floor, which luckily was being, I, I could cover up with carpet, which I had removed specifically to make the furniture. Um, and I got some nicks and bruises, but it, it really actually terrified me because it, it made me realize that um, with something that big, because some of these do become, you know, bigger than life size. I mean, and, and they weigh many, many, many dozens, if not hundreds of pounds. Um, you know, if I hadn't turned around and seen it just in time and it had fallen on me while I, while my back was turned, you know, I, it, I would have been buried in, in possibly very badly injured. Um, and then they, and then the hotel room staff would have had to come and dig me out from under there. Um, so it was, it was kind of a good warning just to make sure not to go, you know, j just to make sure to be vigilant, you know, extra vigilant when it comes to these things. So many of your um, hotel rooms are, uh, they, they're, they're seemingly not cookie cutter. I mean, you know, if, if folks have spent time in, you know, name brand Hilton hotels, name brand Marriott hotels, you know, all of these giant chains, the, the hotels that you're choosing don't feel as if they're as cookie cutter as normal. Can you, I know, and, and, and this idea of slice of Americana, is there a way that you seek out your locations for these photographs? Um, in, I, I mean, I know one of your influences is like Jeff Wall and setting up scenes and, and making these compositions mm -hmm. within spaces. It's like, what, what are you looking for when you're looking for these uh, um, non-permanent residents or temporary residences? Um, that's a great question. You know, it's, um, it's funny. I wonder what this project would look like if I was doing it 25 years ago before we had the internet and before we had things like Travelocity. Uh, because now the convenience of that is that I can, I can log on to that site and I can preview the hotel rooms uh, ahead of staying there. And I can weed out all the ones that are cookie cutter and look the same. Um, unfo which unfortunately, one of the things that I've learned doing this project, uh, especially this part of it, which is the, the cross-country American part of it, is that um, the hotel room industry has undergone the same homogenization as the fast food industry. It's all been bought up by big multinational chains like the Hiltons and the Days Inn and the Marriott's. And they have the same philosophy as McDonald's does, which is that they want each room to look exactly the same no matter what part of the country you're in, so that you know that you're guaranteed the same experience whether you're in Tallahassee, Florida, or you're in Seattle, Washington, um, which is great for them. And it's great maybe for the business traveler because maybe that's what people want is kind of a, a stayed dependability, especially when they're on the road and everything else is so unpredictable. Um, but in terms of local character and the way architecture and the way space reflects the people um, and the communities in which they're based, there's, there's a great erasure that's happening there. You know, and it's an erasure of, of local culture that um, I don't think will ever really come back in the same way that it, it used to be. Um, and so there's something really sad because when I, when I look for these hotels, um, I do look for things that are unique or at least look interesting at least have some feature to it that's not like the cookie cutter you know days in hamptons in whatever um and sometimes it takes me hours of scrolling through pages and pages and pages and pages in order to find just one hotel like that in a state um to go to to drive to to get 
you know, a photograph that's, that's interesting. Um, and that, that is something that I'm guessing might get worse and worse with time, you know, like, um, I'm, kind, I'm really glad that I'm doing this series now because I'm documenting um, these smaller mom and pop hotels before they too get gobbled up by the big multinationals. And so maybe, you know, 15 years from now, this series wouldn't even be possible because they're all, they'll all be, you know, some derivation of, of the Holiday Inn. Yeah, I definitely see that in, in, in relationship to the black and white, uh, what you've put on the wall is all black and white, but have you been working in color at all? Or why do you choose black and white uh, to, to portray this? It does have a classicism, you know, it, it, it absolutely um, helps you navigate your only or your single source light with the flash. Uh, but do you have any other color work that you were work doing? Yeah, and um, actually, well, I put this down, but let me pick this back up again. Um, so originally, uh, these were, you know, I was, I was pretty determined to just shoot them all in black and white because I felt like I was really married to this idea of them being like crime scene photographs because I like the, I like the notion that the hotel is this liminal space, this place that, you know, uh, criminals use as a hideout and artists use as studios and musicians use as like secondary homes and it's uh, a place where you know th this convergence of worlds happens you know where it's illicit activity and creative activity and secretive activity um, and for a while the the black and white felt like that um, really communicated that that's something timeless and something secret um, but during this series, I started opening that up a little bit and, and doing some of the photographs, depending on the room, in color, just to see what that would be like. And I think it's partly because America, if, you know, creating a portrait of America, if something like that can be even conceived of or, or done, um, is so much bigger than any one approach. Uh, and so it seemed appropriate that in some cases, uh, some of the images could exist as color images alongside the black and white ones. This one um, was in Nashville, actually. And um, the, the whole reason that I went to this room was because of this uh, cutout that separated the bedroom from the kind of like kitchen at bathroom area. And I found it so incredible, like a stage or something. And it's such a musical city, and I really like the way that the uh, the mattresses look like they're dancing. Let's see. This was in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and I went to this room specifically for the bedposts. Uh, this was in Ohio, in a place called Strongville, Ohio. And in this case, I didn't add anything to the scene. I just took away these, like all the furniture that was in front of this TV. And then I put it on and it just happened to have a, um, a televised church sermon, which seemed really appropriate for that part of the country. Uh, this was in Lockport, New York, which is a little town about 10 miles south of the Niagara, River, uh, Niagara Falls area. Um, and it's like this little mom and pop hotel that has been owned by the same family since the 1960s. And they haven't really decorated for what it looked like maybe 30 years. And um, I was able to get some really inexpensive rooms because I was traveling during the off season. It was there during the fall. So this room that normally would be maybe like a, a $350 room, it wasn't just a room, it was like an entire suite for a whole family, it turned out you know, to only be a couple of hundred bucks. And it had this giant sectional couch and this cathedral ceiling and this fireplace. And I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is the room for me. <laughs> like it was so romantic. So I just like, you know, built this couch. Like it's, it's nuzzling up next to the, um, next to the fireplace. Like the couch is cold and it's trying to warm itself up or something. Uh, this was in Michigan. Erie, Michigan, um, in a room uh, called the Jamaica Room. 
<laughs> it was all Jamaican themed, I guess. That's why they have this strange palm design thing in the back. Uh, that was in the same room, the Jamaican room. Yeah, the whole hotel, it was it's like a really bad, cheesy roadside hotel, um, had theme rooms. Alex, so. do you photograph the hotel room before you start reassembling it or creating these installations? Or do you take any progress photos? Or, or, or do you have time to take variations in one location? I do, I do, but um, I don't really show those. Those become more for me as references and as process studies. But I don't like to show them because it, it feels like, I like, I like the idea of the image existing um, as the one single depictive image. Um, you know, one room, one photograph, one kind of sculpture. And that's it. And I feel like um, seeing sort of the before and the after also takes away some of the magic, you know, uh, and some of the strangeness. It becomes a little literal, you know, like I like the idea that these things, when you look at them, you, it's very disorienting in a way, which again is kind of like being in a hotel. It's sort of this like weird liminal dis disorienting space because it's so familiar. And so strange all at the same time. Yeah, and your images you're making are so inventive, even though they're kind of stuck in the nostalgia of these, the energy within the hotel and uh, that as you're shooting on location, I wonder if um, all of which, you know, the black and white and the color, they, they feel as if your hand is absolutely in them. So the, you know, a kudos to you to be able to really dive into the hotel room and make it your own. It's really fantastic. Have you been uh, painting at all? Or are you, are you just kind of stuck still in photography? Not stuck, but have you been <laughs> making photographs? Or do you, uh, since COVID-19 has started, I mean, you haven't really been able to go out and do these hotel rooms, despite this uh, fantastic um, honor that you received in the NIFA grant. Um, how have you been coping in relationship of being uh, within quarantine and self-distancing? Well, um, I actually have a brand new series that I've started uh, that sort of overlaps with the hotel room work. And it began through the contemplation of uh, all the really incredibly interesting yet terrible hotel room art that I've seen over the years and years that I've done this project. And so I started to think about like, well, um, if I was to make hotel room art, what would that look like? And what would that even mean? Like what makes a hotel room painting or what makes a good painting or a bad painting in general, like how do we even you know, make that judgment? Um, and so I've started uh, creating a series that I call Paintings for Imaginary Hotel Rooms. I'll switch the camera and show you guys. So these are, um, these are fairly recent, all done I would say within the last maybe three months. Two months? Two months. Yeah, two months. Um, so it's still very much works in progress. Um, but I'm thinking about um, thinking about the way that uh, there's a sort of generic visual language uh, that underlies a lot of uh, anonymous culture. And by anonymous culture, I mean all of these things that populate our lives that um, exist as visual tropes, but don't really have a specific author, you know? And that could be like anything from wallpaper patterns to hotel room paintings, um, to the people that make editing decisions when they uh, cut film for content so that you can watch it on an airplane, you know? And all of these things have this very specific effect on the way that um, we live and the way that we process information and the way that we think and they shape and influence us, but we don't really think about them in the same way that we think about, you know, seeing a Rembrandt when we visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We don't think of it in the same like cultural 
way. But in a way, we're much more exposed to anonymous culture than we are to high culture. Um, and hotel room paintings are, you know, kind of an epitome of that, you know, because we go into a hotel and whoever really takes time to notice the art. And if you do, it's, it's in a, only in a kind of like a, a pejorative way because <laughs> most of the time it's so bad. But I'm really fascinated with the way that um, these tropes are formed, you know, and, um, you know, there are things like sunsets or landscapes or paintings of flowers um, or paintings of waterfalls. Um, and on the one hand, they're, they're so familiar that they've become almost invisible, but um, it's one of these, it's one of these things where uh, the repressed often hides beneath the surface of the banal. And so for me, it's become a challenge to think about how do I take that generic, the generic language of a landscape of like um, a sunset and how do I deconstruct it and then reconstruct it back into something really interesting and something uh, revelatory in the same way that I deconstruct the hotel rooms themselves and then reconstruct them into something unfamiliar and strange and uncanny. Like how can I do that with the visual uh, culture of these um, very familiar and staid tropes that we're all surrounded by? They have so much, uh of a design feeling to the symmetry to them. They remind me a lot of like a Roger ba Brown painting or um, Stuart Davis with these you know, kind mm -hmm. of design motifs and symbols, you know, mingled within these bright color fields, and really illustrative kind of abstractions, but you know they're abstract as you said, these are sunsets, flowers, waterfalls, you know, and all these different ideas, yet they're uh, reinterpreted in your way. Uh, what other influences are you looking at uh, besides just, you know, it's kind of a very clear Roger Brown um, aesthetic, yet, you know, it does branch off into different areas in terms of mark making and painting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, this one, which is um, a sunset with four sailboats, really reminds me of Malevich's work. And it's funny because I didn't plan on it to look this way when I first started the painting, but I think kind of like the photographs, they take on a life of their own. Like the photographs have these art references in them that happen organically through the process of making the sculptures and the installations. And some of them look like, you know, weird constructivist sculptures. And some of them look like minimalist installations. And some of them are like very surreal and, you know, um, and anthropomorphic. And that's kind of what's happened with the paintings as well. They've, they've taken on um, unexpected and very broad art historical references. And I think part of that is just because I, I have such a deep love of the history of painting. You know, that's sort of my background and my wheelhouse and where I came from. And so, you know, everything from like the Renaissance all the way up to, you know, contemporary painters like Lisa Uscavage, you know, it's, you know, it's all material and fodder. There's a piece on the door that I noticed. It's a graphite drawing. Uh, oh, yeah. That, can you talk a little bit about that piece? It reminds me of, you know, uh, a, you know, clearly some sort of moon cycle situation, some Wiccan or warlock <laughs> going on. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that? Um, uh, inspiration, please. Sure. Well, it's, a, it's called Six Eclipse. And so it's six eclipses or six stages of an eclipse with um, various references to kind of cloud formations and sky formations and things like that. Um, and what I think one of the things that I'm trying to do in this work is also like develop a very repetitive visual language is that to me makes a lot of sense within the context of the tropes and the generic anonymous culture that I'm, I'm 
thinking about is the kind of the, the way that it repeats, the way that it patterns, the way that it, um, that it becomes um, fractal-like. Um, and so, you know, creating these shapes, you know, like the circle shape or like this weird like cloud shape, like reducing things to their absolute sort of essential and basic form and making that form really graphic and then using that form um, as a descriptor over and over and over again, which then creates a kind of like a patterned reality uh, really appeals to me. And so like, you know, the, the way that that cloud in the center is really stylized, um, then you can see, you know, the clouds behind her really stylized or the kind of lines in this painting um, and in some of these other works. And so that's, that's another thing that I, I think has become important is trying to develop, um, you know, a, a strange language of repetition in creating these works. Alex, uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, maybe it's good to sit down and just um, put the screen towards you and have your fantastic background behind you as we move into a question answer period for folks that have joined us tonight. I, I first, I had a couple questions in relationship to your work as additions and the photographs. Is that correct? Sorry, you cut off for one second. Can you repeat oh, that? Your work, is it additioned? In the it is, yeah, the photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then- Yeah, they're additions of four. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you do print them larger, what is the size? If these are the proofs that are sitting behind you, what, what are the size of the um, additioned works that folks can purchase? Some of these, uh, it depends on the image. Uh, I used to have a very uniform size for all of them, but because of the variety of images that are, um, that, that have resulted from this cross country journey, I've decided that some of them just work much better as large photographs and those go up to um, 32 by 40 inches in size. Um, and some of them work, much better on a more intimate scale, you know, 16 by 20, um, or even something smaller, like um, nine and a half by 13. Um, it really depends. So I, that's one of the reasons why these are, are still proofs, is I, I uh, haven't gotten to the point where I've completely decided what the size for each photograph is and how many different sizes to incorporate within, within the project. Right. Um, or even, because I don't want it to be completely even, random. You know, I think there should be, you know, standardized, like maybe three different kinds of sizes and then keep it at that. Mm -hmm. And do you think that of these proofs, you would actually make additions of all of them or will you be selective as to what you choose to hold on to as APs or test prints and then, um, you know, further... Are you waiting for a studio visit, for instance, from a curator or a gallerist or a museum in order for the finger to point towards, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, it's clearly you have so much work. Uh, how do you differentiate between what you're going to make into an addition to print? I mean, it costs money to make prints, right? Sure. Well, I'm lucky I, I can print them here at home because I have a professional printing setup. Um, but I, what my goal is, is to have one central image, one main image per state. Uh, so one image to represent each state and then have 50 images within, let's say, the book, within the, the complete set. And then around that, you know, some, some states, uh, depending on the hotel room, like the, the room that I had mentioned, this one, which, you guys, which I had talked about with the fireplace and the crazy sectional couch, that was just such an amazing room that I was able to get um, really like three images out of that room that I'm really, really happy with. And so there's going to have to be some kind of a decision made about like, well, what about those other images? Um, do I include them in the set? Do they become images that are, you know, sit next to the set, but aren't part of the official sort of group of 50? Um, but that's something that I'm, I'm still working out. 
and still processing through. Yeah, and it's, it's at, at a point where your influence and your own curatorial kind of understanding of what you want to do and what you want to share with the world kind of uh, comes to a test between uh, you know, having a studio visit with a museum or a gallery and that which they want to see and which they want to promote. And they, you know, uh, it is, it is a sort of tet on tet with uh, what is valuable or what can sell. And I, I'm, I'm curious as to, you know, you have so much work and filtering th photographs because you, you've had, um, the time to be able to go and, and and get to these spaces and build these installations um, there must be some sort of emotional connection to some of the work too and i i was wondering yeah. if some of the price points or otherwise besides doing it by way of inches or size or centimeters do you ever price your work with an emotional value it's so hard to um uh, to decide sort of what's emotional and what's not emotional because it's all kind of mixed in there, isn't it? Um, you know, I think with pricing the work, um, it's, always, it's always good to kind of deal with the people that are selling the work. And I think those relationships are always a collaboration. You know, when you talk about like a curator or a collector or, uh, well, maybe not so much a collector, but a curator or a gallerist, they come by and they say, you know, we would like this for the show. We would like, you know, this to represent what you're doing. And um, that always becomes a, a conversation that's also a collaboration, you know, where they have their concerns and their vision and their interests and you have yours. And there has to be some kind of a happy, happy medium, you know, because um, it can't just be my way or the highway for either party. You know, oh, and after you as, as running the gallery, you understand that <laughs> better than most, you know, it's like, because um, you have things that you're concerned about with the gallery that the artist may completely not be aware of, you know, and, and there may not be even a reason to make them aware of it. That's just your behind the curtain kind of thing. That's true. Before I open up to uh, questions to the floor slash room here, Zoom room, I was, <laughs> my first question for you was, what the hell were you doing stuck in Basel, Switzerland? Ah. <laughs> well, I was working as an art handler. I thought so. Uh, right, as many of us have done over the years. And I was working for a company which flew me out there. I was very grateful to them. They're called NFA Space and they're out of Chicago. And um, they flew me out and they put me up and I worked the start of the fair and set up the galleries that I was assigned to. And then I was scheduled to work for the end of the fair, but you know, the fair runs for five or six days. And in that time, you really just have to yourself. And that was my second year there. And so I'd already, Basel is a very small town. So I'd just, you know, um, I'd already taken my time kind of discovering it um, and walking the streets multiple, multiple times. So I kind of was finding myself with nothing to do. Um, and that state of boredom ended up spawning all this. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I guess my last, last question um, in relationships is just, as you were speaking, do you uh, have, I mean, your car, you're driving around the continental United States, does your car have a name and what is the type, make and model of your vehicle? Uh, <laughs> this is from lady coming from Detroit, so you got, I got to know. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, my my um, wonderful girlfriend, Janessa, who is also holding uh, the cell phone to make the simulcast with, um, with it looks very um, good. shout out to Janessa. Woo! Yes. Um, she is a genius when it comes to naming things. I don't know how she does it, but she always finds the perfect name uh, for anything. Uh, I have a giant ficus in my room. And I've had it for 20 years and had never had a name until I met her. And then she was like, Mike the Fike. It's Mike the Fike, duh. And I was like, yeah, you're right, it's Mike the Fike. Uh, so the minute she saw my car, she was like, that's Betty. So the car's name is Betty. And it's a 2002 Honda Civic with 
just covered in dents. I mean, this car looks like it has driven through Fallujah. And um, there's rust spots on the roof. And so when I was driving cross country, it started leaking. And there's like little drips that would come down whenever I would be in the rain. It's got 167,000 miles on it. Um, Very good. But God bless her. It, it, it runs great. The engine is in good shape. It, it wasn't for the rust spots and the dents and the peeled paint. You never know that it was such, a, such an old, old car. She's, a, she's an old lady, but she got style. That's right. She's got style. Betty, Betty's, been, Betty's been very good to me. Nobody thought that she'd make it cross country, and she has. Aww. Well, you know, with that, I just needed to get a little bit of that personal in for a hot minute. I'm wondering if uh, any of the meeting room has questions for Alex about it, anything, really, his process, his paper, his painting technique. Um, and certainly, let's, if you feel comfortable unmuting yourself, your microphone, and your video, by all means, or if you feel more comfortable chatting it up, we've got the chat screen going here on the right, or on, um, on the bottom, you just open your chat screen. Someone asked about the painting, the flower in the hand. I wanted to oh. know if it's oil, if it's oil paint. Oh, somebody on Instagram asked about the painting that's of the flower in the hand that I have on the door. <laughs> Uh, and they asked if that's oil on canvas, and it is. Yeah, that one is oil on canvas, and the rest of these are uh, um, uh, mixed media. They're gouache, acrylic, and oil. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alex. Uh, this is Shoshana here. Um, I really uh, love the work. Uh, it kind of reminds me of survey photography from the Bonda and Hilda Becker. Um, they mm, did like yeah. water towers and um, really, really lovely. That's actually inspired yes. my own work. Um, and thanks for answering the questions earlier, too. I wanted to know, you mentioned uh, renegade art and this whole kind of activity as being sort of installation renegade work and I was wondering as an act of like be uh, rent guerrilla art <laughs> warfare um, would you ever consider going to the um, back to the hotel or having a picture of one of your previous installations and like hanging it or like leaving one of your photographs from a previous hotel in the space as like a way of like leaving your work oh that's um, an interesting idea yeah kind of like your you're sort of hiding it in the room where yeah it's like the, like a performative like you're like kind of leaving uh -huh. this like it's a performance all night you know that you're doing yeah. sort of uh behind closed doors and then you put everything back and then you kind of like leave <laughs> like a little nail and hang like a little work somewhere i don't know just thinking about that idea of like renegade art and then like memory so there's like one other aspect of it right it's kind of like um continuing the interaction somehow so that it it um it's not just that i leave it's that that i also kind of like return to the scene of the crime <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, yeah yeah you know that's an interesting idea i i haven't thought of that one thing i've thought about is possibly taking some of the paintings that i've been doing into the hotels with me and then staging scenes of the paintings inside the hotels and using my paintings instead of the paintings that the hotels come in so that then I'm, I'm incorporating the painting work into the hotel room sculptures. Um, but then another thought that I had was possibly um, uh, constructing uh, hotel rooms here in my studio, like constructing a, a set that looks like a hotel room, specifically built around the paintings that I'm making and then photographing that. So then there's the images of the hotel rooms that I've, um, the actual hotel rooms that I've been in, and then there's the paintings, and then there's images of imaginary hotel rooms that I've constructed with paintings that I've made specifically for them. Um, and kind of bringing it, sort of creating this kind of like very elliptical relationship to uh, all of those spaces. Well, it's an exciting project. I mean, you know, <laughs> right now hotels are being used as like uh, 
comfort homes for people who can't be home. So yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how we think about dwellings and spaces and this sort of like temporary, you know, bedroom mm -hmm. that we have. Um, and depending on how long we have it for, um, you know, it's kind of interesting too. So I uh, really, really like the work a lot. Thank you so much, Shoshana. Yeah. Thanks for asking your question. It's a really considerate question, especially in relationship to the follow-up, um, you know, coming back and planting uh, mm -hmm. your re-envisioned mm -hmm. space within the hotel room. I had someone on Instagram I saw ask, which is your favorite? Do you have a favorite painting or do you have a favorite work that mm -hmm. uh, in the last, you know, series that you've created in the wall behind you? I don't know if I have a favorite um one that i am really taken with right now i mean it's so hard to like pick favorites because then it um it's, it's so many it's so there's so many um so many different experiences i mean each each photograph is like a uh, um a memory object in a way but this one in nashville I've really, really been enjoying just because it's such a musical one. And some of these images can become uh, very lonely. And they, they are about sort of artistic obsession and about loneliness and about what we do in behind the scenes when we're alone and nobody's there to witness. You know, they're, they're, they, they can be really strange, but there's something really... Um, musical and and fun about this image i don't want to say fun but you know there's a levity there you know like they they feels like these um, mattresses are dancing on a stage and the lighting um accentuates that and the colors accentuate that and there's something i, I find really satisfying about that that, that there's three of them it's not, it's it's not like one sculpture it's almost like three separate entities so so I've been enjoying that one quite a lot recently. Um, Kelly Schreer, one of uh, the curators at Art Fair, um, is asking, you know, you have such a great sense of humor with the work. And is that any goal of the work? Is that a goal of the work? You absolutely make viewers smile um, when they see the work. But is that the emotion that you want to evoke? Not exclusively, you know, but I think humor is so necessary to any work, at least for me, when I do, you know, like I, I always know that I'm on the right track when I'm making art, when I make myself laugh, like and preferably laugh out loud because something is just so ridiculous. But I'm kind of like reminded of um, this quote by... Um, uh, Lauren Michaels, who's the inventor and producer of Saturday Night Live, and he was um, somebody, they were like interviewing somebody, like a former cast member. I forgot who the cast member was, but he said, you know, Lauren would always say that um, you have to, it's not just that you have to get laughs, you have to make sure that they're the right kind of laughs. <laughs> and, and it's sort of like, it's so true, you know, like whatever emotion you put in, um, if it's humor, you know, there's got to be, for me, uh, a sense that it's not just the, you know, a single word punchline. It can't just be something like really obvious, you know, but I think I like, I, I do enjoy having some of these pieces go in that direction, you know, but not exclusively, because then I think, then it does become kind of too self-evident if it becomes all about just humor or sadness or if they all look like crime scene photographs and they're all really gritty and dark and you know mysterious, you know, I think there has to be some um, diversity. Oh, you just cut off. I have another question on Instagram. This is when you sell prints, do you sell them frame and matted, or do you sell them just the prints um, themselves? I do both. It, yes. it yeah, it really depends. Um, Sometimes people have their own framers where they can get a better price than I can get. Um, but if they um, need to have a print that's 
framed and matted, I can, I can have that arranged. I've done that before. I know framers and matters in the city. So I send the print to them and, and create the final piece like that and send it out. If there's time for just a question more or two, if anyone is interested in asking Alex any other questions, feels, please feel free to unmute yourself. I'm gonna add a little excitement to the recording when we post it later. I'm really happy to see um, folks that did join us tonight. Um, Alex, I had a question. I know you've had, you know, shows in Owls. You've um, had a solo show at Slag. You create. Uh, there's a two-person show at West Rick Wester. Uh, we brought you down to Nada, Miami this year. Do you have any upcoming shows, or is there anything in the mix that you might be able to? I know that there's a lot of cancel culture right now, but is there anything? Right. On the, on the horizon that you can talk a little bit about uh, in terms of um, exhibitions, even, even online? Um, online, I am in an exhibition with uh, Studio Associate, which is a um, online platform for artists created and run by Jen Hitchens. And um, it's currently on Artsy. And I unfortunately don't have the information right in front of me. Uh, but she's working with a, a Lower East Side gallery uh, whose name escapes me, uh, I'm afraid to say. Uh, so that just opened today. And then there's another online exhibition that is being created uh, that should open within the next couple of weeks. It's called Strange Times, and it's by a curator from Ukraine out of Odessa. And so that's going to include a large group of people that are making work during this time of corona um, and otherwise when it comes to this work i am in conversations with se with, with several people about um, exhibiting and uh what to what, the direction to take it in terms of that and making a book out of it uh, because i think it would be important for it to be represented in book form uh, not, and, and that that part of it can really expand on the project and it wouldn't just necessarily be only the images that are behind me but there could be other images that i've taken along the way that are part of the journey um, so there's some very fruitful uh conversations afoot uh which have all obviously been slowed by the time we're living in tell me about it we have two last questions. One might be a long one, but one is a little bit of a shorter one. Um, they both are, before we close out here, why do you choose editions of four? And I know you do usually do two APs with that, but then, you know, why do you choose editions of four? And then um, lastly, where do you find your inspiration? I think the editions of four question is, um, I, 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 I like a smaller edition. I think I like the, the sense that it's not um, it's not this giant, massive run, you know, of dozens and dozens of images. I, I like it to feel special on that level, and um, and especially when I'm making so many images um, it, of of all these different rooms, and then the the whole body of work really starts to bloom very, very quickly because there's so many rooms involved. Um, if each image for each room then also had a large edition of 12 and 15 prints and then there was like hundreds of prints and each one had 10 and 15, you know, it just starts to become really unwieldy. Um, and so I like, I like the idea that it's, it's, it's a smaller run. As far as inspiration, I mean, that's, um, I mean, everything, I think, um, I think, I, well, let me think about something specific, like things that I'm specifically have been really, really into. I really, I have this album that I recently found of Buddhist bells and it's like this LP and it's really weird and really cool. And it's just like these wind chimes that they use in Buddhist monasteries and also like prayer bowls. 
um, and singing bowls and giant gongs. And it's just this atmospheric music of, of that stuff. Um, that's incredibly inspiring. Uh, I just found a, a really wonderful Stephen Shore book. Actually, Janessa gave it to me for my birthday. Uh, and it's his photographs from the late 70s curated by uh, 10 different people that have come together and picked their favorite ones and these are, have never been published. That's kind of really incredible. I think literature is always really great. I'm currently reading a this Faulkner book and his use of language is just so incredibly trippy and elaborate and beautiful and poetic. Um, so I don't know. I like, I like, I like variety and I like complexity and I like to play and put things together. So anything that, that involves that, that it has like play, complexity, variety, strange, unexpected things coming together, forming things that are unusual really appeals to me. I like to think of my work as revealing the playful and the unusual and the, the mysterious and the beautiful behind the everyday and the overlooked. Um, and so I really enjoy things that, that do that in the real world. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I love this quick yet encapsulating moment of inspiration. I know you can have so much. <laughs> uh, it was really wonderful to hear a lot of your insight in relationship to your process and uh, where you're coming from when making your work, both in photographic form as well as painting and drawing. Uh, really glad to have you here tonight and sharing, you know, just part of you. And thank you for being part of our <laughs> And thank, thank you, you so everyone who is here tonight. Thank Fabulous thank you. Work. And um, everyone stay safe, stay well, and whew, Thank you, Lisa. I'm so grateful to be a part of this platform and thank you for, for hosting this and for inviting me. It's, it's an absolute pleasure and um, very grateful to have had this time to chat with you. Absolutely. Thank you for organizing and hosting. It's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, next week we have Heidi Norton on the studio live visit with Art Fair and so hope everyone can join us. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Thank you, Janessa. <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.